Hi there, my name is Tony Ayuto. I'm an engineer at Google. I work on the Bazel open source product. Today, I want to talk about ensuring OSS license compliance the easy way. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a programmer who wanted to ship some OSS products, or ship products containing OSS code in a way that was compliant with their licenses. So I'm going to talk about what we're doing. Uh, the model we use for thinking about this that allows us to scale to a very large organization, uh, specifically Google's... Um, the examples come from Google's uh, version of this system. I'll talk a little about a bit about how we can use this mechanism to do things that are compliance and audit related, but not necessarily about licensing. Um, and finally, how this is available in the OSS build tool, Bazel. Um, and that last point is why I've got Bazel logos on the slide rather than Google's. Um, this should all be available to you already as open source. It's not a proprietary thing to Google. Um, we can start by thinking about what OSS license compliance really is. Um, and it, it's straightforward. I want to use other people's code, and I want to respect the terms under which it's made available. Uh, and respect the terms has two parts. Do the things that are explicitly required. Uh, don't do the things that are prohibited. Uh, and the things that are required are usually easy to think about because they're often spelled out. Uh, you have to, for notice style licenses, you must provide a copy of the license text and copyright with your product. Um, it's very simple. If you have a, a license you pay for by seat, it's spelled out in the license. You pay them this much money, depending on how many units you ship. Uh, so they're easy to think about. Uh, don't do prohibited things is rarely spelled out in a license, but what we have is the situation where certain things are difficult to comply with. Uh, for example, LGPL code has to be distributed in a way that the end user can relink their application using their own build of the LGPL library. Uh, yeah, I can do that on a desktop app. It is virtually impossible and unreasonable to try to do that in a phone app. Um, I could do be compliant with Herculanean effort, but it just isn't going to happen. Uh, so we think of that kind of thing as don't ship LGPL code on a phone. Um, so this is all pretty simple, right? You, you read the terms of the license, you make sure you comply, you get your best and your brightest together, the engineers and the lawyers are in the same room, they compare the terms of the license with the intent of the product, and... You know, if it all works, you ship it. Uh, and we do this by, by throwing people at it and looking. We enumerate all the OSS packages in our product. You know, if we're a startup, we got 10, 12 packages. I can read all the licenses. We do the things that are required, mostly gathering the text of the licenses. Don't do the things we shouldn't. Uh, you know, don't take GPL code and put it in a proprietary product and distribute it to people. That's disallowed, right? Not, not supposed to happen. Um, and if I land five or ten packages and applications in my company, I could do this. I could probably do it myself, and I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but I'm assuming some of you listening today may work for organizations that are a little bigger than a startup. Um, you know, when you have 10, 20,000 programmers working on a thousand different products, uh, using five thousand different OSS packages, you're too big to put the right people together in a room for every product launch. Uh, you have to automate uh, anything you can, and you have to make sure that people are only working on the tasks where they add value um, to, you know, where, where we can't automate it, and they're the right person to do the human labor. Um, so let's talk about the roles involved. There, there are three roles in this dance. Um, and a small team, they blur, but it really does help to think about them as separate entities. Um, we have product engineers. They understand what they're building. They're building a mobile app. It has these characteristics. It's going to collect personal data or, or not. But they 
they're close to the to the end user in this process. Uh, there's another role though, uh, and I'm going to call them the OSS engineer, the OSS importer. Um, in a small organization, it's usually the same engineer. In a large enough organization, it might be different. And the OSS engineer is responsible for uh, finding the package you know, in the wild off GitHub or Maven, bringing it into the organization, making sure it works with your build system, um, in our case, assigning license attribution, um, and, and providing, you know, frequent pulls from upstream to get new features. Um, now, you notice the one role here is the OSS importer doesn't necessarily know where the code is going to be used. Um, for example, I, for historical reasons, I happen to be the maintainer of libcurl and libusb at Google. Um, and, and the USB library is used in dozens of different places. I can't enumerate them. I don't keep track about that. I just am responsible for every once in a while updating things, making sure it builds, making sure it builds on all our platforms. Um, but I don't get to answer the question about, are you using it in the kind of place you should? Um, uh, that's really the job of the compliance team. Uh, they can evaluate whether the conditions attached to a license, the, the restrictions and, and prohibitions, uh, match the intended environment the product engineer wants to distribute it in. Um, so let's combine uh, these roles with the model of how we think about licensing. Um, all OSS, OSS code is made available under one of our kinds of license. We use the word kind a lot. Um, and the kind has specific conditions. And products and artifacts that we build are deployed to various environments. Uh, So it's the OSS importing engineer who is the one who's closest to taking the code, looking at the license. They'll work with a compliance team, something to make sure they've got the right attribution, but they're the one saying, oh, this, this library I've brought in is in a, under the Apache 2 license. And that's all, that's their responsibility, saying it is Apache 2. Um, the meaning of Apache 2, well, that belongs to the compliance team. Because once you've said the kind of license is Apache 2, there are specific conditions attached to that. And the compliance team typically, in this case, for Apache 2, is going to say there's one condition that you need a notice of the no that you're using it. Um, so you have to include the license text, include a copyright notice. Um, another aspect that the compliance team thinks about in conjunction with a few senior engineers is the kind of places or the, the environments you can distribute an application to. Um, and there are not many. There's, cons there's phones, there's desktops. Uh, maybe you want to distinguish between Mac and Windows desktops uh, if you need it. Uh, there's your servers in your data center, servers in other people's data centers. You might distinguish geographic regions if you want to um, use this kind of mechanism for uh, compliance with, with others' legal jurisdictions. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Um, but there are a few artifacts, the order of 10 to 100 of them, not tens of thousands. Um, and there's this role that I mentioned before, the product engineer, they don't really have to think about this. They just know they're building an iPhone app. And the rest of the system we build around it understands how to look at licenses to, to make sure that they can be put in the iPhone app. Um, and so we scale by making sure humans deal with as few pieces as they need and that um, Domain specialists are focused on the things in their domain and not doing grunt work in the other domain. 
Along with this model, we rely on some tools that help us enforce the, uh, the limited amount of human intervention when we need it and, and to help make sure that people don't end around the system uh, inadvertently or on purpose. Uh, the first is you, you always need a robust and auditable source code control system. Uh, it, you need to know that a, an engineer can't check something in without it showing up as a change. Uh, you have to be able to lock down certain pieces to say that they require special review. Maybe a particular team has to review them. Maybe uh, three reviewers have to review every piece of code in there. But whatever you do, you need this kind of compliance. And you need that for other things besides licenses. You need it for SOX compliance. Um, you need it just for your own sanity and safety. Uh, if you can't tell how something got in your source code control system, you've got far bigger problems than license compliance. Uh, the second thing we rely on is a hermetic build tool. Uh, and by a hermetic, I mean it can only pick up things that are in your revision control system uh, or potentially on a trusted server that you have populated with things from your revision control system. Uh, it so we, we have that in Bazel and Google's internal fork Blaze. Uh, the build file specifies everything that goes into an object and the dependencies are, are listed and so on and so on down the tree. And it always comes out to source that's checked in. Uh, you know, if you were shipping a medical device, you can't have it include a library that happened to be on Alice's machine because she was the release engineer, you have to ship things that you've vetted and audited and made sure that they're security compliant uh, and, and tested. Um, so any other kind of build system, it isn't going to give you that peace of mind that you know the provenance of every bit in the applications that you finally shipped. Uh, so, let's see how this sort of looks. This diagram is a little busy, and we'll come back to it in detail, and I'll, I'll go through it very quickly. Um, in Bazel parlance, there are um, files that, that have the rules for how we build things. They're called build. Uh, they're named build all the time. The upper blue corner... Uh, box talks about an iPhone app um, and it's named Angry Hedgehogs. It has some dependencies. I'm um, spelled angry wrong. Uh, it's what the product engineer knows about. They say, I'm building an iPhone app. That's all I have to know for license compliance. Uh, and it has some dependencies in the little blue box below it. Um, and that may depend on more things. And eventually it depends, in, on, in this example, on a piece of code from uh, the Google's AppSale library, which is available under an Apache 2 license. We call it the license kind. We've extracted out the copyright notice, and we've pointed to the text of the license. Um, that license kind um, points to code also in our repository. We have a, a rule in system that says the Apache 2 license kind has the notice condition attached to it. Um, and the compliance team also owns a test here that takes in the combination of the application we're building. Um, the basal label in this case is the path to the build file colon the name of the target, so it's some service, colon, Angry Hedgehogs. We know it is of an iPhone app. That's the environment it's going to be into, the binary type. Um, and because our build system has a very clear sense of the dependency graph and everything that went into the target, we can examine that to gather all the licenses used, the license kinds they use, and the union of the conditions that they use. and, and put that together with this target and the type and we can see if we win or not. So this should be easy, but if the condition 
you know, requires end user relinking for an LGPL library showed up, we would fail this compliance check. Let's look at each piece slowly in a little more detail. Um, we declare licenses uh, in, in the package where we, we build the code. Um, I don't really claim the license. We uh, say that the code is available under an applicable license. Uh, most packages have this very similar boilerplate at the type. We give a default for the entire uh, set of code in the library. There, there might be multiple targets. Maybe we build the, the library in different ways. Um, but we say the default is the rule called license. Um, we always have a license rule declaration named license. It usually lists the license kinds. Uh, in this case, we're saying it's an Apache 2. We extract out the copyright line and point to the license text file. And note that most of this can be done by the importing engineer. Uh, the only place where they really have to consult anybody else is making sure that the text of the license uh, really is an Apache 2 license and that they're, they're pointing at the right thing. Um, we can assist with tools like automatic license classifiers that look at the, the, the license file and go, ah, yes, with 99% certainty, this is an Apache 2 license. Uh, here's the right license kind declaration to put on it. Um, but, you know, it has some extra words that we haven't categorized. Um, there is no getting around the human element here. Uh, most OSS providers really do try to give the right attribution uh, to their, their code. They, they include license files. That they, they try to do the right thing. But some of them play with the code, play with the text. They change it. They reformat it. They add commas. It changes the meaning. You, you have to audit this with a human. That's where the compliance team comes in. Um, fortunately, you don't have to do it that often, right? Uh, we use our source code control system to help us out here. Um, we have meta, you know, metadata checks when you try to submit code. And if um, we're changing the content of the license text file or changing any of the attributes of a license rule in a, in a package or the package default changes, then our source code control system says, I need an additional reviewer, and it makes sure the compliance team is added. And in practice, this just doesn't happen, because once people decide the license they want to make their code available under, they don't change it a lot. It's a rarity. Most of the time, they just add features, and if I want to import a new release of the library to get new features, I can just do that, and everything works great. <clears throat> Went too far. Uh, the license kind declarations are sitting in a code path owned by the compliance team under compliance rules license SPDX. Uh, Bazel has an alias capability so that I can say at rules license and have that point into my own code base. And license kinds tend to accumulate in a, in a file and they're pretty simple. They're a name. Here we're using the SPS, uh, SPDX identifiers, a list of conditions, and there are a small number of conditions. These are typical ones. Notice requires relinkable, disclose modifications, right? You have to publish your changes to a library you made. Um, and we point to the canonical text. Um, Again, we link the source code control systems protections to the responsibilities of things. This, the declarations are in a place owned by the compliance team. So random engineers can't make things up and the compliance team can know that the only licenses we think we're using are ones that they have vetted and, and looked at. Um, now, a great part of the model here is, is We've got this SPDX namespace. We're using SPDX IDs. The conditions, though, can be organization-specific. So I could conceivably 
look at a particular kind of license and go, our organization has to do something special with this for one reason or another. Um, <clears throat> and add a condition that then can be used by our own compliance tools for whatever purpose we, we envision. Um, so that's the important part of the model. The name of the license doesn't imply anything about where you can use it and how you can use it. It's the conditions we've attached to that name that make the choice for us. Um, we go to the product engineer's view. It's very simple for them. They don't really care anything about the licenses. They just know they're building an Android app. They're angry hedgehogs. Um, behind that view, there's the things going on that we saw in the diagram. Their app really has a license check rule. Uh, Bazel can descend the, all the dependencies of the license and get all the, of the application and gather all the licenses. Um, there's tooling within there to gather all the license texts together and, and order them and compress them so they can be a resource in the application. That way you can have a screen that lists all the licenses and copyright notices. Um, and somewhere we have a target that is the Angry Hedgehog's license check that compares the application name we're building and iPhone and the union of all the conditions we've found to decide if we can ship or not. And alternately, we could put that test within code owned by the compliance team rather than alongside your application. <clears throat> Either is supported by the model. It just depends on where you want to build your uh, compliance in. And we're not particularly limited to licenses that you know about, right? Um, we can incorporate uh, proprietary licenses. I've struck a deal with XYZ Systems to use something. I have to pay them per seat. So I don't want that in every application. I want to have an allow list so only certain applications can use code that depends on that. And so I can make up my own condition for that and say that, well, that condition requires the allow list and it must be on a server. It can't be shipped on a an end user device because then I'm going to pay a million seats. Uh, we can think also of constraints that are imposed on us by ourselves. I've written some code that, let's say, would never possibly be GDPR, GDPR compliant. Uh, and so I never wanted to apply that in the EU. Well, I can make a license for that, right? It's not really a license, but it can use the same mechanism. And so compliance license is internal, not GDPR compliant. It has a condition that says not deploy EU. Now, so imagine We've got a packaging system where I'm building a Debian package. And one of the things we throw into the package is this <clears throat> list of all the licenses that we've used and their conditions. And now I distribute this package to all of my data centers and it hits the EU data center and we try to install it there. And one of the install checks on the machines go, wait, this code says not deploy EU and I'm in EU. We can fail there. And so you could use the same kind of license mechanism as part of your um, DevOps so that you could restrict yourself from running code in the wrong place because you would not be compliant with a rule you made up yourself. And really, when you think about that, that's no different than complying with uh, a, a license and a legal contract. So what's the status of all this? Google has been migrating to this over the last year. Uh, we're about to sprint on getting it into Bazel, or at least making it available. The underlying code that, that makes this happen is, is there. Um, there's a public design that you could review and comment on. That's been out for over a year. And if you have questions, you can shoot me mail or catch me during the Q&A session. Uh, so, uh, you know, with that, uh, I thank you for being here today. Uh, I hope this was informative and uh, 
Good luck and stay compliant. Bye-bye.